Hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our Lavender Lit Book Club Author Talk with Deborah A. Miranda, the amazing award-winning poet behind this month's book, Altar for Broken Things, which you can tell I love by just how many post-it notes that I put in this. Before we begin today's program, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we are hosting this event. The New Haven Pride Center was founded and operates on the traditional lands of the Mohegan, Mashantucket Perquat, Eastern Perquat, Scotty Cook, Golden Hill Pawgusset, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac peoples. We hope that from wherever you are, you take a moment to acknowledge and honor the native people whose lands you occupy and the history of the place you are in. Find out more about native lands at native-land.ca. Now, I'm excited to welcome you to today's program. The Lavender Lit Book Club was founded last year as a way of bringing people together over shared stories and celebrating the voices of queer and trans women writers. It's a space open to all, and I hope to see you at future discussions on the second to last Tuesday night of the month at 6 p.m. This month, we had the pleasure of reading Altar for Broken Things by Deborah Miranda. Finally, before we begin, we'd like to thank our sponsors who made today's program possible. Thank you so much to CT Humanities for all of your support and to People Get Ready Books for supplying the books to readers across Connecticut and supporting this program. Your support helps facilitate important conversations like this one. If you'd like to know more about sponsoring programs like these, please feel free to reach out. I'd also like to take a moment to thank Lisa and CM for conducting our ALCL interpreting and all of the amazing interpreters that we work with to make our program more broadly accessible. Now, let's begin our program. I'd like to now introduce Deborah A. Miranda, our star of the hour. Deborah is an enrolled member of the Ohlone Castanoan Esalen Nation of the Greater Monterey Bay Area in California. Her mixed genre book, Bad Indians, a tribal memoir, Heyday 2013, received the 2015 Penn Oakland Josephine Miller Literary Award a gold medal from the Independent Publishers Association, and was shortlisted for the William Sorolian Literary Award. She's also the author of four poetry collections, Altar for Broken Things, Raised by Humans, The Zen of La Llorona, and Indian Cartography. She's the co-editor of Sovereign Erotics, a collection of two-spirit literature, and her work has appeared in many anthologies, most recently, When the Light of the World Was Subdued, and Our Songs Came Through, and of Theology of Native Nations Poetry. Deborah lives in Lexington, Virginia with her wife, Margo, and she's the Thomas H. Browdis Junior Professor of English at Washington and Lee University, where she teaches literature of the margins and creative writing. Thank you so much for joining us, Deborah. It's truly an honor. You are one of my favorite poets, and this book brought me to tears in the best possible way. Um, and I'm so excited to be able to have you with us. And I believe that you're reading When You Forget Me from your book. Yes, thank you so much for having me here. And um, thank you to everybody who's tuned in and especially to the interpreters. This is called When You Forget Me, which is a riff off of a poem by Pablo Neruda in which he says, if you forget me. This wasn't a question of if, it was when. When you forget me, the past is a poor broken basket woven by hands that had no muscle, no song. When you forget me, every word we spoke together, just before or after slow first light, lips still wet, dough, heron, stone, prayer, erases itself from every language as if never spoken, extinct. When you forget me, dream of other women, offer them the dance of your heart, recline in a meadow, drink red wine, seek another woman's blush. What basket could hold all this desire? I'll gather black maidenhair fern stems, red bud, bear grass from our sacred places. I'll harvest, split and dry each piece. My busy hands won't miss the obsidian outline of your face. When you forget me, that river where we first kissed won't stop flowing down from mountains older than desire. When you forget me, the forest that cradled one our creation 
won't burn down. Some things last. I'll remember what they are, one by one, as I dye my bundles, start the coil, fit weft around stave. I'll remember how to make a life out of fragments, how to splice so skillfully no visible break remains. Thank you. Absolutely. I gave a collection of poetry by Pablo Neruda to my partner um, pretty early on and when we started dating. Uh, she noticed it on my shelf and gave it to her. I, oops, you're a little I, bit frozen there. <laughs> I, Worst in there. All right. Thank okay. you so much um, for bearing with me. So that was an absolutely beautiful poem. Thank you. I do have a question about that uh, later on, but I actually wanted okay. to start off with a little bit about your history as an author and a writer. So mm -hmm. poem is in the six ways to reinvent language. Can you, you know tell what? Us a you little broke bit up about a little bit. Why this love sounds. Oh, how, all right. How Thank I became so a writer much. and what? <laughs> and where this complicated love of writing and language stems from. Oh, okay. Yikes! I was one of those kids who just always wanted to be a writer. I wrote my first story when I was seven years old. And it had a beginning, a middle, and an end. And it, I think looking back now at the story, I can say, oh, I see where that girl is coming from. It was a story about um, rabbits in the wild um, making families and then everybody being killed during hunting season. <laughs> and then, you know, making a new family and coming back and having it be hunting season. and. At that point, I stepped in as a narrator and rescued these poor rabbits, right? Because and took them in, you know, said the little girl took them into her house and they lived happily ever after. And I didn't realize it at the time, but that was a really um, formative moment in which I learned that I could take some control of my life, which was in total chaos as a child, um, and make a structure that could hold it and that could contain some of my confusion and pain and questioning, which I really didn't have a place for in my life. Um, as, a, as a young kid, um, I was in a very, um, I was in a family that really struggled and there was a lot of alcoholism and a lot of violence and there was no place for a quiet, sensitive little girl, really. So writing kind of became my second home and that of course goes along with reading. I read a lot. <laughs> yeah. So I would say that that was, that was the beginning was that I realized that through writing, I could prevent myself from being erased in the world. And it helped me hold on to a space for a really long time until I was able to really more consciously step into my life and save myself. Absolutely. Um, I really appreciate that idea of being erased in the world because I think that comes up so much within this uh, particular collection as you deal with themes of grief, of healing, and also themes of you know memory and love mm -hmm. and how we want to be remembered. Um, the poem you just opened with, When You Forget Me, uh, definitely touches upon this beautifully as does the title poem, Altar for Broken Things, Uh, and memorize, praise each star on her body. I've been dealing with a lot of grief in the past year, as so many of us have, and I wanted to ask, you know, what do you hope readers can get out of reading poetry like yours? Hmm. I think probably, I hope that there is some resonance for them, that they can feel seen or heard that somebody else has also felt what they've been feeling and survived and found a way to make something out of it. So I think that there is a, 
there's a definite, I mean, it, poetry is about trying to communicate one image from the poet's mind into the reader's mind. And oftentimes that image is a very abstract image, you know, hope or, or love or survival, things that are very hard to talk about. But if you can find the right image and, you know, plant that in somebody's mind, then it's like a seed and it can grow into something that they can feed and allow to influence their lives, right? So I've taken a lot of heart from other poets. Other poets have, you know, have meant a lot to me. And those are the things that I think matter to me when I'm reading them. You know, does this person see me? Not me, me, but like, do they see the kind of position that I could be in? And do they have a way to speak about that that might be helpful to me? Um, so I, I hope that happens for other people. And I also hope that a lot of times other people are able to say, hey, she wrote about that. You know, maybe mm -hmm. that's not forbidden. <laughs> maybe I could do that. Maybe I could be brave enough to attempt that because I get a lot of my courage from other writers. Absolutely. Um, I have to say that on a personal level, I found this collection to be so healing. You know, it was the book I didn't know I needed to read, but I definitely needed mm -hmm. to read it. So thank you, first off, just for writing this. Um, you capture both personal and political grief, but also hope incredibly well. And on the topic mm -hmm. of politics, there's quite a few strong messages in this book. Um, one that stands out to me and to the readers that participated in our book club was your take on the environment and how we've kind mm. of treated our planet. So what was on your mind as you put together this collection and we're thinking about kind of impending, you know, climate disaster, environmental destruction and so forth? Mm. You know, a long time ago, uh, my son, my son Danny is about 30 now. But when he was only about 15, I had a book of poetry came out and he come out and he read it. And he said, Mom, why don't you write about, why do you always write about unhappy things? Mm -hmm. And it just kind of went to my heart. Um, and I thought, is this really what I want to, you know, leave behind? And so I started very consciously um, trying to praise things in my daily life, but also in my poetry. And really slowly reconciling the fact that you can praise things, but you also have a lot of broken things. Um, and how, you know, how do you praise broken things? So the first poem in this book is called um, How to Love the Burning World. Yeah. And I think that's that was kind of my mission for a long time was to see the brokenness in the world and to love it. Um, and also to find a space for it so that perhaps it might be possible to do some repairs. Um, in terms of the environment, I don't really think about the world in that way, in that separation um, between, you know, there's the environment and then there's me. It's more like, this is my world. This is, this is what we have. And it's a part of me and I'm a part of it. So trying to find ways into that um, in the book, looking at these, you know, usually very small moments of um, when I felt connected to the world. And very often, because of where I live, I live in the Shenandoah Valley mm. in Virginia, which is really beautiful, really gorgeous. It's very, it's very, well, it's not West Coast mountainous, but it's mountainous. Um, and there are beautiful flowers and, you know, animal and bird, and they're just everywhere, everywhere you look. Um, even in town, the deer just walk right through town. So it's, it's actually, you know, in the, especially right now when I'm teaching virtually every day, all day, um, it has gotten harder to be a part of that world. And I have mm -hmm. to consciously make myself go outside and, and breathe and sit. But um, yeah, so thinking about the world, I, I want to try to praise it. And so often I want, I, what I want to praise are the things that people don't notice. Absolutely. There's so much said in that. Um, 
and I can't possibly do it all justice, but I wanted to point out the line that I flagged here, which is, you aren't required to love the flames, but love the burning world. Um, and I just love the juxtaposition of those two lines, you know, that, and later um, in one of the poems that I wanted to discuss, you know, love by any means necessary. I just thought that was absolutely so beautiful and so powerful. Um, and one of our club members, Madeline, I want to give her a shout out here. Put it beautifully when she said that instead of vilifying humans and humanity, you see everything as connected. As you just said, you don't. Mm. It's binary oh. between the environment and people. Um, and she really loved that about this book and I did as well. Um, and in this way, I feel that your identities uh, really came through in this collection. And there's so much to discuss here, um, but I'll keep it to a few poems. So let's first talk about indigenous physics. Um, I felt the tone and structure of this one was kind of a departure from the rest of the collection, but it fits so well with the overall messaging. So can you tell us a little bit about the process that ran into writing this poem? Yes, it is an unusual poem for me. I don't often go into um, science and I don't often use a lot of jargon, but what I wanted to do with this poem was talk about the way that current um, research and studies are continuing to more and more find connections to traditional indigenous um, medicines and not just, you know, not just concrete medicines and ways of healing, but also ways of thinking, ways of knowing the universe. Mm. So that um, in a, in a, it's kind of like um, Western culture is taking the long way around to get back to where we actually were at, you know, before we were um, invaded in the, in North America. So I, 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 I intentionally did a lot of research on um, what kinds of terms are used to talk about nuclear radiation and half lives and things like that. And then as the poem goes on through each part, I'm consciously kind of walking closer and closer so that those two paths meet in the end. And mm -hmm. there is a sense of um, we can still talk about physics and the universe and the galaxy and how to solve problems like um, environmental pollution mm -hmm. um, and still be speaking in indigenous terms because we already know about that. We already know how to do that. So it was a poem about hope um, mostly, and but it was also a way, a poem in which I'm trying to kind of bridge the bridge worlds. Yeah, absolutely. I think you do an amazing job in terms of bringing together, I think it's actually aligned in one of the other poems, um, you know, the science, but also the, the kind of beauty and mm -hmm. you know, nature of things. Um, yeah. And you write in a way that's able to speak to so many different people of so many different lived experiences. And I thought that was mm -hmm. a, a really special part of this book. Okay. Um, yeah, and on another book that really speaks to your identity and um, this one was a, a difficult one, but if I say the words, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of the ones that definitely brought me to tears, but in a good way. Um, and you were able to capture so much in this poem from that initial sense of shock and denial, I think that goes with the grief that so many of us experienced in the wake of the Pulse nightclub shooting to the violence and hatred of that incident, but also to the sense of love and compassion that ultimately saved at least one person's life. Mm -hmm. And I think as you try to say in this poem and in this collection can save in, you know, an entire world, right? Um, but as a mother and as a queer woman, was it hard for you to even write this poem? And how do you feel it connects to the, the rest of the collection as we're thinking about broader themes of, you know, hope in the face of destruction. Right. As a mother, this this particular, you can tell that that image of the mother mm. at the nightclub was the image that I couldn't forget. Um, it was the image I couldn't ignore. And she just kept coming back to me. Um, and I, I felt so 
so clearly that she did what I would have done. Um, what I think, you know, mothers do without even thinking, right? To put yourself between harm and this person who holds your heart, mm -hmm. um, whether that's a biological child or not. But um, her act of love, the fact that she was there in the first place with her son mm -hmm. was something that just touched me deeply. And the fact that she was taking part in the dancing and that she was um, experiencing joy and then to have this happen. Um, she did one of the most heroic things I can think of. And I don't just mean throwing herself in front of her child. She was heroic in that she embraced joy in the face of destruction. And that is something I struggle with every day. So writing the poem, writing poetry is not hard for me. It is something I can't not do, right? It's like mm -hmm. not breathing. But um, facing the images in the poem um, was hard. But then after I would get something on the page, I would think, I'm remembering them. I'm trying to create a memorial for them. And I'm trying to make something beautiful out of their lives, not out of their deaths, but out of their lives. So that helped. Um, but it, it was, it was once I had it down on the page, a rough draft of it, um, I took it to a memorial and I read it and then I worked some more on it. Um, you know, obviously showed it to my wife and, she is my best editor in the world. And she took a machete to it and took out a whole bunch of stuff mm -hmm. that wasn't necessary. And, and I ended up with um, something that felt worthy of putting out there for their memories. So, yeah. And that's kind of what I wanted it to be. Yeah. I remember that incident so well um, because it was going to be the first Pride Parade I was ever going to participate um, in, um, was in Los Angeles the very next morning and I woke up um, and my mom sat me down and told me the news. She said, I'll go with you and I'll walk next to you and I'll hold your hand. Um, and I don't want you to feel scared because of what happened. Yeah, yeah, and, what a um, mom. She is a very good mom, very supportive. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll send this to her and send the, the poem to her because it reminded me so much of mm -hmm. that, that mother's love, right? Yeah, that, yeah. You know, they're there. Um, and that this mother had for, for her baby. Um, and that all of the parent, the parents who weren't there had for their children and, and were not able to intervene. You know, that I think maybe that might be why this woman stood out to me. Um, because, you know, you, you, I think I put something in there about, you know, the phone calls and, and the parents on the other end of the line. And um, yeah, it was, it was a, it was a tough moment here in a small, predominantly white, predominantly straight, sometimes homophobic, you know, small town in the South. It was tough news to get and to try to find community to mourn with, um, you know, that was, that was hard too. So maybe in some ways writing the poem helped me make a space for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and sorry, I'm getting a little no, bit personal. Me too. Thank <laughs> you about that, that incident. Um, but that speaks to the power of what you were, were mm. able to write and able to capture here. So, so thank you for that. Um, another poem uh, that reflects on being in a small town. And I'm actually, I'm going to come up here and also say that Audience members, please put your questions in the, <laughs> in the, the comments section. Um, but you have um, another poem where you speak to being in the South and um, getting the news of a particular jury case. Oh, um, and, oh, this one, that was also one of the, the tough ones, um, and I'm trying to, to find the exact page here, but, you know, can you- I think it's called weather. Yes, weather, thank you. Um, can you speak a little bit about 
this particular poem and um, what it was like to kind of reflect on this particular community experiencing loss and you know, something that in a lot of other places would inspire outrage and inspire protest mm -hmm. and having to deal with it in such a mundane almost way as if it's just a fact of life. You know, what what went into writing that? Well it's a it's a tricky thing um, writing about your neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> But I live, we live in um, one of the last two black neighborhoods in Lexington. Lexington's a small town um, and the black neighborhoods have been slowly kind of encroached on. So we are in one section of it. Um, we're on a corner and one of the corners is formed by an alley. And down that alley live four or five um, black families who've been there for many generations. So we were strangers in there neighborhood. Um, and we've been here, oh gosh, almost 10 years. And we just became used to hearing, because their houses are small, they live a lot in the alley, right? It's almost in the summertime and spring, it's like an extension of their home. So we hear everything. We hear about their parties, we hear their fights, we hear their music. Um, and on Father's Day, um, Father's Day weekend, they were having a big family um, gathering. And there was lots of barbecuing and lots of great music. And that was when we got the news about Philando Castile. And I heard it come across the radio because they had their radio on. And there was just this pause that happened in the air where everybody in the neighborhood was like digesting this information. And then slowly it was like everything in that pause was everything. And I don't really think I captured it in the poem, but there was a pause in which I could feel people thinking, we can't show this, we can't show this pain. We can't show our rage. We know our place in this little town really well. And we will, we will show our pain and rage, you know, somewhere else, some other way, but we're not storming down to the park to protest and, you know, we're not whatever. And there was, there was just this moment where I realized they have learned how to live in the South with this kind of news. And that's why at the end it says, um, yeah, no verdict in Virginia. That's like a June weather report, 90 degrees, 89% humidity thunder, lightning, no verdict, rain, it's raining men. And yeah. I just, it's normal. It's very normal to have this happen. Yeah. So I tried to capture that without encroaching on the families too much. Um, I mean, I felt my own pain about that, but not nearly the way I would feel if I lived a daily life in this town with black skin. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that poem was able to capture that kind of nuance there um, really effectively um, as best as, as you were able. So yeah. it's one of the ones that I, I wanted to remark on because it, it kind of stands in contrast to, you know, being a queer woman and, and hearing the news about Pulse. Um, you know, having to deal with that, that grief on your own. Um, and I feel sort of empathizing Mm -hmm. um, to the extent that you're able to with the grief that this community was, you know, feeling on on Father's Day and mm -hmm. had to kind of bear with and and struggle with um, amidst celebration, amidst, you know, weather reports and, and all yeah. of that. Absolutely. Um, so just another reminder for questions from the audience. Um, but during our uh, book club discussion last Tuesday, we all remarked on how spiritual this collection of poetry was. Um, but in a way that's also open to a lot of interpretation, uh, to diverse perspectives, and that doesn't necessarily, uh, that takes a lot of different avenues, right? In some poems, you, you push back on, on religion and on particular narratives. Uh, you question a lot more, and in some ways you synthesize 
um, and bring together different avenues of religious belief or spiritual belief. So the readers in our group were really interested in knowing more about your spiritual background, how that informed your writing, and the kind of conflicts that you came up with in these different poems as you tried to approach that mm -hmm. spiritual lens. Well, first of all, I'm just glad that people um, people felt that that kind of journey um, towards a kind of spirituality and didn't feel put off by it. I think sometimes that can be too much of that can be hard to take in a collection of poetry. And I did I did want to make this um, a journey that was honest. So mm -hmm. I think that that poem about um, oh, I can't even remember the title of it, but it's when Turtle Woman is is trying out all these different um, different kinds of religions, and you know though many of those things are I mean that's all very um, autobiographical. You know I I did. Um, I did have a mother who tried out many, many different spiritual paths. Um, and so I was exposed to all of that as a young child. And thinking about religion and aspects of God, different aspects of God, different aspects of the sacred, um, those were not strange things to me. They were things that we talked about every day in my house. And questioning those things were, was not strange to me. So I never, I didn't grow up with any boxes in terms of what is sacred and what is not sacred. Um, I think I felt on the one hand, a great deal of potential and possibility um, for what could be. And on the other hand, um, also a lot of disappointment because so many times I was disappointed um, in either the, the um, institutions around these, some of these religions or individuals in the institutions. So, um, I think that it basically shows me um, kind of coming towards my own version of spirituality, which as I get older becomes more and more um, based on indigenous um, beliefs, but also um, the ways in which we um, need to reinvent some of our traditional beliefs in order to you know, have some form of continuance um, or survival in the future. So, this thing you mentioned earlier about connection. And um, I think that has quite a bit to do with um, some of the poems about spirituality. They're, they're seeking um, to find a connection either with somebody or with a larger entity um, and to make sense, to make sense of both the beauty and the destruction in the world. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm really glad you noticed that. Um, I think that one of the things that's happened for me in my life is um, a lack of trust. When you grow up neglected and abused, it's very difficult to trust even just the other people in your lives, let alone to trust that there is a sacredness in the world um, and a sacredness within yourself, right? So yeah. learning to trust for me has come more through an experience with the natural world and first, and people second. <laughs> and um, you know, once I once I realized that that was perfectly okay for me to do, um, then I think I had a smoother path. Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, there's so much to say there. Um, <laughs> yeah, that that just resonated with me. I think as a survivor of, you know, partner violence and also someone who had, you know, a mom who's a, a domestic violence survivor as well, um, definitely, you know, understand that kind of mm. difficulty, right? With right. embracing faith and with embracing spirituality because, you know, you, you begin to question how people like that would be put in those, those mm. paths and, you know, mm. come to be, right? You wanna believe, and the inherent goodness of people, but you've also seen a lot of the not so great parts about um, people, right? Mm -hmm. so that can be something that's really, really difficult. Um, and Lindsay commented, uh, Lindsay's one of our really active uh, book club members, <laughs> um, God's House on, on page um, 57. Yes. Um, which I also really loved. Uh, I think it resonated so much with both of us. Um, I think Lindsay, you know, came from from her experience as someone who's uh, 
in the Catholic uh, tradition, mm -hmm. um, if I'm remembering that correctly. Sorry, Lindsay, if I am getting it wrong. Um, and I'm someone who, with similarly a mom that was very all over the place, um, arrived at kind of a, a Jewish understanding and tradition of- My um, mom too. <laughs> um, yeah, my, my mom married my stepdad um, and he was very, typical Jewish guy. And so she kind of settled with that. Um, mm -hmm. Sort of also describes herself as a bit of a witch, but yep. um, yeah. Um, so I think we both really resonated though with this idea of, you know, finding God in places that, you know, they're not being revered in, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and wanting to make place for God to, you know, be, celebrated by yourself, right? Mm -hmm. That if God mm -hmm. doesn't have a home, that if God is, you know, found in these places where they're not being respected, wanting to like go out to the beach and build this yes. altar um, by the ocean. I just thought that was such a beautiful image there, right? Um, you know, and I'm someone who who believes kind of God is in, in, is in everything and a little more, more abstract about that. And this idea of wanting to invite God into your life as opposed mm -hmm. to finding God wherever you know they might be mm -hmm. that really resonated with me. Um, I'm so glad. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I, there's not much of a question at the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, me rambling, I, but I'm when, glad that. Yeah, when I look at this poem, um, I think about the ways that we're always I think you know I come from a I come from a place in which religion was a form of genocide, mm -hmm. um, particularly um, the Catholic religion as it was delivered to us in the 17 and 1800s in California. And so I'm not big on proselytizing. <laughs> you know, I really do feel like it should be an invitation. Mm -hmm. You should invite this concept or this entity or this sacred being to dwell with you and yeah it just the idea of of having it sort of instilled i think is probably comes from from a, a long line of bad catholics <laughs> um, so yeah i i think that that comes through in the poem and this idea of um building a place for God in a very symbolic way in your life um, and then inviting that, that um, concept into your life, which is, takes a lot of trust. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and finding that trust is, is so, so difficult. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate the way you're able to capture that nuance. Right. And I think mm -hmm. as poor people, right. We always, you know, we push back against that, that system in a lot yeah. of ways because right religion has been so so harmful to our community in a lot mm -hmm, of ways, mm -hmm. right? But yes. I think there's also a really wonderful way of making space to be both religious or spiritual mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and queer. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you're able to do that in, in the collection so beautifully. So thank you. Well, it, it's, a, it's a work in progress. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, people are work it's in progress. So, That's right. You know, um, all of these journeys are, so thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to get to the, the questions and the comments uh, really quick. Okay. Um, but just before my second to last question for you is um, about Turtle Woman, because I just have to ask. Um, so it's kind of a recurring character um, of sorts through throughout you know this journey. Um, mm -hmm. It seems to represent you in a lot of ways, um, but I also got the sense a little bit more about um and you know the journey of incorporating turtle woman and mm. your, your poetry yes turtle woman um she makes um she makes appearances mm -hmm. and i think she is um sometimes an aspect of me sometimes she's an alternative me um from an alternate universe maybe but she is somebody who is um always questioning and always seeking. And I think that that's her purpose in my poetry. I think that she 
can do things that I can't do. She can, she maybe is a little bit braver than me. And um, I don't sit down thinking I'm going to write a poem in which Turtle Woman is, is the, you know, speaker or somebody acting in the poem. She just comes. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like um, she does a lot of, she does a lot of work. Um, mm -hmm. And she's, she's um, very protective. I think, I, I think she's, I think that's part of her function is to protect me um, and to allow me to explore, but at the same time to protect me um, if I'm feeling vulnerable. So um, I do definitely identify um, with the turtle, um, the whole concept of, of needing to have a hard shell and needing to withdraw and um, being at home in myself um, and, and sort of solitary. Those are all parts of me. Um, and I think Turtle Woman um, is a way for me to put that, put that part of my persona into, um, into action, into my poetry. So I think she does a lot of different things, um, but those are some of the things that I'm aware of. She probably does things I don't even know about. Yeah, absolutely. I love writing poetry, but I find I also kind of resort to fiction a little bit and creating characters when mm. I need to step into different perspectives to explore right. their situation. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely, that the idea that Total Woman is a uh, almost like a, a tool for you to reflect um, mm -hmm. through your poetry, I think is mm -hmm. really awesome. So some of our audience members had questions for you. Okay. Um, the first one comes from Miranda, um, a different Miranda. <laughs> um, wow. Miranda's present in the, this conversation. Um, is that if you couldn't be a writer, what would you do? I have so many things I want to do and not enough lives to mm. do them in. Um, I would probably love to be a letterpress printer and um, make handmade books. This is something that I do occasionally. Um, and, you know, you never do anything really well if you don't do it enough. So I'm just a hack, but I love it. I love making books. I love the sewing. I love all of the details that go into it. And I, I've done letterpress printing, but not for many years, but I also love that. I think I love the ritual of it and of setting mm -hmm. those words. It's so symbolic, you know, and it's so mm -hmm. sensory and tactile. So I'd probably be a letterpress printer and bookmaker of some kind. Um, yeah, something with my hands, um, because that's the other, that's the other part of my life. Um, my dad was a carpenter mm -hmm. and taught me um, to use tools and power tools and how to make things. Um, so I do really love um, creating something, the physical manifestation of something in my hands. I just love that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I definitely resonate with that. I think in the pandemic, the silver lining of sorts, um, mm. is that there has been a little bit more time for me to get back into those tactile activities. Good. I've been making a lot, making tons of bagels. Um, <laughs> And the audience are probably laughing to themselves about um, and trying to do sort of things around the house to to make things, you know, a little mm -hmm. bit more comfortable. Um, and I think that, you know, I love the jobs that I'm able to do and I love writing, but that, you know, tactile sense of mm -hmm. uh, labor and, and productivity, you know, right. always feels like it's missing from my life. Um, yeah. I've been able to introduce that a little bit more. We live in our heads too much. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a whole nother conversation about um, the ways we've become detached from our labor and, and making things, but right. that is uh, a lecture series in the, in the making. Right. So I don't into it too much. Um, and finally, um, Miranda asked this, and this Miranda also wanted to ask this, which was to share some of your favorite poets since you talk mm. about loving poetry so much. Right. Uh, you know, oh gosh, really spoken to you, right? Um, 
Okay, so I am currently teaching this book, which is, I, I just love, um, Claudia Rankin, Just Us, An American Conversation. Mm -hmm. She's a poet, there is some poetry in here, and then there um, is a lot of, uh, it's, a, it's a very hybrid text, so there are photographs and charts and things like that, right up my, right up my alley, I love that stuff. Um, I also have just recently read um, Craig Santos Perez's book, Habitat Threshold which is um, very environmentally based. Um, he's uh, from Guam, but currently living in Hawaii. And um, it's, a, it's interesting because um, he often centers his daughter in a lot of these poems. Um, mm. And that really speaks to me as well. But I think um, becoming a parent, it didn't change the work that he does in the world, but it made it more urgent. So it's it's a beautiful book. And um, I read a lot of native authors, um, get a lot of inspiration from them. Joy Harjo, Christos, um, someone who passed away a few years ago or maybe two years ago, Janice Gould. Um, and, um, ooh, Pablo Neruda um, was a big influence in my life at one time. Um, and still sneaks in, as you can see from my poetry. Um, yeah, just, I mean, when you teach, you have um, access to a lot of um, new writers or writers who are you know, just kind of coming in to the scene. We have a lot of guest speakers here at the university that I've, I've been really lucky to meet. So people like um, Ada Limon and um, Amy Nizuma Mikado. Sorry, that's going to be really hard. <laughs> she just goes by Amy Nez a lot of the time. Um, so yeah, it's I've been really fortunate in that way, and I think it's helped my writing to be exposed to younger writers and people who are doing new things. Mm. Who's your favorite up and coming writer? Um, if you have. Mm. Gosh, I, it seems like every time I read a book, I'm enamored of that writer. Um, yeah, this is a hard one because there are so many great writers coming up, um, and people who are, who have already made it. Um, I know that Laylee Long Soldier probably doesn't think of herself as one of the luminaries, but she is, yeah. um, her book, Whereas just, it just is amazing. Um, Cassandra Lopez, who wrote, um, I think she wrote Brother Bullet. And um, she's another California Indian writer who I think people need to keep an eye on. Um, mm -hmm. She's she's doing some incredible stuff. So yeah, it's um, it, there's just too many to name really. And also when I'm reading a book of poetry, I am in that book of poetry and I can't think about anybody else. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like being in love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I definitely, I'm not the type of person who could have given an answer to the question who are your favorite. It's poets. tough. It's um, tough. I mean, even now their names are running through my head. Hyde Erdrich, you know, mm. um, her new book is scary good. Uh, it's called Little Big Bully. And it's about all the kinds of bullying in our personal and political lives. And that's just, you know, she does some things in that book that um, her, her style, her formatting, her, um, use of the white space on the page. Yeah, I just look at it and go, wow. Maybe I'll just go back in my little cave now. <laughs> please don't, please don't. <laughs> um, awesome. So yeah, we have a couple of comments and questions coming in. Um, thank you all. So Katie May asks, um, you're joining from New Hampshire and are wondering if you find that people are drawn to poems that you've written that you don't expect them to relate to. Um, if you've ever had that experience of, of being surprised, I guess, uh, talking mm -hmm. to people about your poetry. I'm thinking. Mm. I can't, I can't remember a time um, mm. when I was surprised I have been pleased um, that somebody connected. But I, I don't think I would put a poem out there if I didn't think there was a way for somebody to connect to it. Um, mm. 
so I'm, yeah, I'm not sure if I could say yes to that. I, I, I think, I hope that most of the things I put out there, somebody could connect to. And it's not that I, I don't look at people and say, oh, I can't believe you like that poem about um, Indians running amok or something like that. Um, yeah, I, I think people are, are capable of lots of connections. Um, and if they're reading poetry, they're already kind of self-selective, you know, they're, they're already telling you that they're willing to um, mm. go with you wherever you go or to at least, you know, attempt it. So, yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not surprised too often, um, more just kind of pleased when it happens. Yeah, absolutely. I think poetry is such a empathic experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I would have trouble describing it, but absolutely love it. And it's part of why I wanted to start this this book club, right? So that we can yeah. together, that we can honor amazing uh, queer and trans women writers, and that we can share these stories together. Um, just wanted to point out a final comment. Um, Samantha said that palimpsest. Palimpsest. I'm oh, hoping I'm not, yeah. uh, not butchering that too much. Um, made me stop and think something about it really touched me. Uh, thanks, Samantha, for that comment and also for joining us for a book club last week. Um, and thanks to everyone who is still here with us. I have one final question, which is mm -hmm. going off the theme of the group. I have to end by asking that as a queer woman, what do you want to say to aspiring queer women writers and to readers who identify strongly with your work? I would say be brave, write the unthinkable, take care of yourself as you're doing that and afterwards, because it can be difficult. You are accessing a lot of um, tough stuff, but also I would say, um, don't be afraid to write crap because <laughs> You know, I've written a lot of crap in my lifetime and sometimes it's just my warm up. Um, sometimes you have to um, dig deep. You have to put a lot of fertilizer in the garden before it produces. And, you know, it may not be the prettiest stuff, but it will probably get you where you need to go. So yeah, those are the things I think I would say. Um, and read you know, read like crazy. Um, there are times when a poet's work just it won't speak to you and you just put it away and come back to it in five years, you know? Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, that's happened to me, especially as a young poet, I would just think, I can't connect with this. It obviously is well-written, but it's not, it's not ringing any bells. And then I, you know, come back to five years later and I'm like, oh, <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, okay. Um, and so I just wasn't ready. So find the find the poets that um, resonate with you. Um, read them. Um, you know, absorb what they're doing. Try to, and and try to think a little bit. Um, you know, after you've read the poems, distance self, yourself a little bit and look at it and say, how do, how does that poem make me feel? And then ask yourself, how did she, how did she do that? You know, and try to you know try to see if you can figure out what's working in that poem and maybe try some of that in your own work. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us for this amazing discussion. It is truly an honor to be able to have this conversation with you, you. Um, to have you know read your words and to actually be able to ask the questions that I think a lot of people have when they read a book and aren't necessarily able to speak to the author about. So this was such a joy, um, such a privilege. Is there anything you'd like to say to close this out? Just that um, I'm so glad that you are doing this group and that, um, you know, this poetry is becoming more and more accessible to more people. And that is something that does my heart good. Um, I'm really, I'm really pretty excited that um, it's becoming a force again in the world. And I think for a while we lost sight of the power of what poetry can do and what it can accomplish both for individuals and in larger um, larger movements. So yay, poetry, and good for you for starting this group. And thank you so much for inviting me and um, making me a small part of your life. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much. That warms my heart. It was amazing <laughs> to hear that. Um, and I have some closing remarks. So okay. Patrick, to your thing behind the scenes. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Um, and thank you all again for joining us for tonight's program. Um, we want to remind you that the center is here for you year round with dynamic programming, support services, case management, and more. And you can find out about all of our upcoming programs at newhavenprizecenter.org. And with that said, I'd love to see each and every one of you um, on Sunday, March 7th for our day of action in honor of International Women's Day. We've got an amazing jam-packed day full of poetry and drag performances, a panel on activism and art, a panel on community organizing, and a workshop co-hosted with Planned Parenthood Votes Connecticut that's going to give you the tools to advocate for change. There's also an opportunity for queer and trans women of color to network with each other, and that's supported by Caroline and our panelists at Collab um, from last week's Queer Women in Business Talk. We'd also love to invite you to join us for the 18th, I can't believe it's 18, um, 18th annual Dorothy Awards on Saturday, March 13th at 6 p.m. Although I'm so sad that we can't be with you in person this year, um, we're going virtual and that means we're also free this year. So you can get more info at DorothyAwards.org. Don't forget to follow us on social media, including at New Haven Pride Center on Facebook, at New Haven Pride Center on Instagram, and at New Haven Pride on Twitter. And subscribe to our YouTube, youtube.com slash New Haven Pride Center. And finally, if you enjoyed today's program, please consider joining us as a member. It's free at newhavenpridecenter.org slash join now. Or consider making a donation if you're able to support our programming at newhavenpridecenter.org slash donate. Thank you all in the audience for joining us. Thank you for your questions and have a great rest of your night. And I hope to see you at the next book club. <laughs>